Hi everybody, I'm Andy Ringer from the Mayfield Clinic and the Neuroscience Institute here at TriHealth. And I wanted to talk about a topic that's become a lot more uh, aware, a lot more commonly seen in our community, and that, that is that of uh, hyperflexibility or connective tissue disorders, in particular of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. We see Ehlers-Danlos in neurosurgery in a number of different venues, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the diagnostic conundrums that arise when it comes to hyperflexibility disorders and ehlers danlos This uh, talk is part of the partnership that's been long and proud between Mayfield and the Neuroscience Institute at TriHealth. Uh, we are gonna talk today about uh, ehlers danlos syndrome. And of course, that comes in a number of different flavors. The most common of which, however, is the hypermobile type of ehlers danlos syndrome. And that is the one that is most commonly seen most commonly comes to clinical awareness and is seen most often in neurosurgical practice as well. This is typically diagnosed by the Baden score, which is a nine point score done looking at hyperflexibility of a number of different joint spaces. As you may be aware, this is how it's performed by doing these different tests that you see here. They can be done at the bedside or in the clinic to help identify patients who are hyperflexible. This becomes important to the neurosurgeon in particular because the same hyperflexibility exists in all other joints, including those of the spine and of the cranial cervical junction. Those joints, when they become hypermobile, can become somewhat unstable. And this can result in a, a number of different anatomic changes that can result in neurologic compression, uh, can result in hindbrain herniation, it can result in changes in spinal fluid uh, dynamics at the cranial cervical junction. Uh, a number of different things that can result in neurological symptoms, including headache and neck pain. Uh, and so this is where they, these patients typically come to neurosurgical attention because they are sent looking for some other spinal disorder or some more other uh, neurologic disorder. And the reason for this is uh, we typically see it at the cranial cervical junction where the uh, integrity of the anatomy is highly reliant on a very complex network of ligaments and tendons that you see here. These uh, are uh, very robust in most of us and provide good stability for these junctions, uh, for these the cranial cervical junction and these joints, and allow for normal movement in all planes of movement. However, uh, disruption or laxity in any of these ligaments can result in abnormal movements, settling of the cranial cervical junction, compression of neurological elements, uh, change in anatomic relationships that result in neurologic symptoms. Among the most common that we see for the hyperflexible population is in head and neck rotation because uh, this is uh, the predominant movement at the cranial cervical junction at uh, the occiput to C1 to C2 with rotation, as you can see, being the, the major movement that occurs here that, again, is restricted based on this network of ligaments that helps hold things together uh, but doesn't do so well in the cases of hyperflexibility disorders. So this is where we come into this diagnostic conundrum for most neurosurgical patients uh, who may present with some of these symptoms. Because patients with hyperflexibility disorders may present with some fairly common symptoms, such as you see here, headache, which can keep, uh, come in a number of different flavors. It can look like migraine, cervicogenic headache, uh, positional headache, any of a number of different patterns of headache that can occur, neck pain, if there is neurologic compression, you can see sometimes numbness or weakness in the arms, hands, or legs, dizziness, or even gait instability. But it can also produce a number of different syndromes, or symptoms rather, that are typically part of other diagnoses that we see often in neurosurgery. They, these uh, symptoms can be fairly protean, they can be hard to localize, they can be difficult to attribute to the hyperflexibility, and yet they happen anyway, and they sound a lot like the symptoms that we hear from patients with a number of other disorders that sometimes come to neurosurgical attention for care. And some of those other diagnoses that cross over a great deal with the hyperflexibility disorders are listed here. Chiari malformation, which uh, the true Chiari malformation is a congenital hindbrain herniation below the uh, foramen magnum. Uh, but patients with hyperflexibility disorder can develop this anatomic appearance just as well with many of the same symptoms. Likewise, uh, low uh, cerebellar tonsils can be seen in idiopathic intracranial hypertension, what we used to call pseudotumor cerebri. <laughs> this is a result of elevated pressures inside the head, or 
due to low pressures causing almost a sump effect from intracranial hypotension due to spinal fluid leaks and other uh, similar disorders. Uh, and a lot of these things look very similar to patients who have uh, associated uh, instability at the cranial cervical junction, atlantoaxial instability, basilar invagination due to settling of the cranial vault onto the spinal uh, canal, uh, and cervical instability. So I'm going to talk about a few of these to discuss how they typically present, what are some of the uh, diagnostic maneuvers we do to differentiate between them, and a few warning signs about things to do uh, when we're facing these diagnostic dilemmas. So when you have, uh, because of these, uh, this high variability, we uh, have now become much more aware in neurosurgery that we have to screen for hypermobility when we are faced with that patient who has headaches or neck pain and low-lying cerebellar tonsils to understand that this might not be Chiari, this might not be simple pseudotumor, this might be a hyperflexibility disorder. And as a result, I've taken to screening patients with that bait and score to look for the, those types of abnormalities. And we also look for things, uh, anatomic findings, to suggest whether or not there might be instability at the cranial cervical junction before we consider doing what is often uh, the surgical treatment for these other disorders. So let's start with the Chiari malformation. This is perhaps the one condition that has had the most crossover with Ehlers-Danlos and hypermobility disorders. Uh, again, the, the true uh, Chiari malformation is considered a congenital disorder where uh, there uh, have been a number of theories as to, <laughs> as to why this develops that have uh, evolved over the years, starting from a hydrocephalic uh, theory causing compression of the brainstem downward to a congenital disorder. And, and finally, what we have uh, currently believe is the case is that there, the, basically the posterior fossa vault, the volume of space is too small for the brain that it contains. So the cerebellar tonsils are uh, congenitally herniated down through the foramen magnum, and that this results in an interference of normal spinal fluid flow between the cranial vault and the spinal canal that results in the accumulation of a pressure gradient over the years that results in symptoms, and sometimes can even cause a searing in the spinal cord. So we look at this a number of different ways. One is by looking at the degree of cerebellar tonsillar descent, which is shown in the top left. We can also measure or estimate the volume of the posterior fossa to see if it appears small compared to the normal anatomy. And very often we will get what we call a Cine MRI, that looks at spinal fluid movement and pulsation. And as you can see in the example here on the right, you can appreciate some interference of normal spinal fluid pulsation and the cerebellar tonsils themselves piston up and down in relationship to the pressure gradient that develops with CSF pulsation. So these are diagnostic maneuvers of Chiari with CSF flow uh, interruption. Now, when we are faced with a patient with symptomatic Chiari, we might choose to simply watch and wait, and uh, by that we typically talk about some lifestyle modifications, maybe home exercises or physical therapy, things that can help modify or manage their symptoms. And for some patients, that's perfectly successful. Uh, for, for other patients with more advanced symptoms, we may have to consider surgical decompression. And this happens when the patient has intolerable symptoms or they're developing a syrinx in the spinal cord, and we think we have to regulate that spinal fluid pulsation across the cranial vault and the spinal canal. Um, so for those patients, and this is important to understand why this becomes a conundrum with the hypermobile uh, patients, for the patients who do require surgery, this is a surgical decompression that involves removal of some bone, typically about a three or four centimeter space uh, adjacent to the frame and magnum to widen the posterior fossa. And in my practice, almost always the C1 laminectomy to allow uh, exposure of the dura well below the cerebellar tonsils. We then typically open the dura and sew in a patch, all designed to open up additional space to allow free movement of spinal fluid around the cerebellar tonsils. Uh, there has been some discussion of avoiding the um, dural opening. However, we've recognized in those uh, practices that uh, avoided dural patch grafting, as you see here, that there was a higher rate of recurrent symptoms and those patients ended up needing patch graft in the future with the second operation. Um, so, <clears throat> so typically we do this all up front. But as you can imagine, th this does involve disruption of some of the normal soft tissue planes in order to perform this surgery. So for a patient who is already hypermobile, who might be relying on that muscular support for stability, we have now disrupted that stability in order to achieve the surgery. 
So while most of our patients with a true Chiari malformation will see significant improvement in their symptoms, about 70 to 80% will have meaningful relief of their headaches and neck pain. Um, some of the brainstem findings that they may have, such as swallowing problems, facial numbness, tinnitus, things of that nature, are, are typically do also improve, or some other uh, difficulties of, of uh, um, paresthesias, and neck, uh, I'm sorry, numbness, sleep disorders, things of that nature, might take longer to recover, but we still typically see a very good response to this surgery for the vast majority of patients. There are, of course, some potential risks associated with the surgery. Uh, some patients might develop a, a spinal fluid leak around our dural patch graft. That was part of the reason for the enthusiasm to avoid it in the first place. Uh, if our patch graft isn't watertight, so we take great pains to make sure that it is, of course. Uh, uh, like any uh, surgery, there's a low infection rate, but that can potentially still happen. Uh, and there can be, some for some patients, a worsening of headache or neck pain related to the surgical site. However, this is most pronounced in patients who have a pre-existing hypermobility disorder. For those patients, once again, we may have aggravated their hypermobility during the time of surgery, at least until the soft tissues have a chance to, to uh, um, heal again and become more stable. We also recognize that, that uh, CSF leaks or cerebellar sag may be more common in patients with hypermobility disorders, again, because of the loose collagen in those patients, which also provides support to the dura, and as a result, uh, when we do the bony decompression with or without a patch graft in the dura, there's some risk that the dura itself becomes stretchy and the cerebellum may actually sag, causing um, uh, dizziness, balance problems, and sometimes even nausea uh, for these patients. So it's very important for us to understand if this patient has hypermobility before we consider doing this type of a surgery. Uh, this is such a recognized phenomena that one group in uh, Iowa with a pretty well-known uh, spine surgeon there looked at patients who had uh, anatomic findings of Chiari malformation who ultimately ended up needing spinal, uh, cranial spinal fusion surgery. And they divided these, they looked at this series of patients and found um, uh, that this was predominantly a young age group, uh, that they looked at dynamic uh, flexion extension MRI testing or CT testing. Uh, to look for this uh, instability and found four categories of patients. That those were patients who had reducible or non-reducible brainstem compression, and those who had or did not have a bony anomaly at the cranial cervical junction. And this isn't the kind of thing that we would necessarily expect most of you to be able to discern. But uh, again, people who uh, patients with a uh, osodontoidum, uh, os for example, uh, uh, inc incompletely ossified. Uh, dens at C2 or some other bony anomaly, uh, anomaly that may re cause compression of the brainstem in flexion and reduce an extension, that many of these patients actually benefited from cranial cervical junction fusion surgery to help minimize that movement over flexion and extension. Uh, this also happens sometimes in iatrogenic cases where previous surgery had been done that destabilized the patient, similar to the uh, destabilization we see in the ehlers danlos syndrome. Uh, patients. So again, this is a real phenomena. It's not common, but it is a very real phenomenon, something that we have to worry about. So when we are looking uh, at patients who have hypermobility or EDS, uh, who may have pain from uh, occipital cervical instability, we have to look at the, the risk of cerebellar sag. We have to look at the risk of CSF leak. We have to look at the risk that we may de further destabilize these patients even though they come to us looking very much like a Chiari malformation. So that's part of the diagnostic conundrum. Another uh, diagnostic area that we see that uh, sometimes crosses over is uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, formerly known as pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, and this is a uh, disorder typically believed to be an impairment uh, between the production and reabsorption or circulation of the spinal fluid that results in an idiopathic rise in intracranial uh, pressure that can result in a number of different symptoms, the, mo the most significant of which is, is headache, of course. Uh, but patients with this disorder do also complain of a sensation that they have fluid um, behind their eyes or in their ears, they hear a ringing in their ears. They may have many symptoms that sound very much like a Chiari malformation or like somebody with cranial cervical instability. Uh, usually the headache is frontal, but sometimes it can be suboccipital as well. 
And there is, uh, as you can imagine, where you've related to the raised intracranial pressure, an incidence of cerebellar tonsillar descent that looks like a Chiari again. So for these patients, again, it's a diagnostic conundrum as to what, what exactly is the cause of their headaches. In fact, um, one study looked at patients who have uh, pseudotumor and recognized that at least 6% of them also had radiographic findings of a Chiari malformation. And that is about uh, 8 to 60 times that of the general population, so significantly more common. Uh, in fact, some degree of tonsillar descent is seen in about 24% of patients with pseudotumor or, or IIH. Uh, and many of the symptoms cross over, as you see those listed here on the slide. These symptoms are typical of not only of Chiari and of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but can also be seen quite frequently in our hypermobile patients or in unstable patients. Um, and in fact, patients uh, who ultimately are diagnosed with uh, pseudotumor or IIH, um, uh, who have Chiari malformation uh, dec uh, decompression surgery, will frequently have recurrent symptoms. In fact, about 40% of patients who have uh, failure of their failure of symptom resolution after Chiari decompression surgery are felt to have pseudotumor or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So, for those patients. Typically, we recommend a lumbar puncture. The workup of IIH involves measuring spinal fluid pressures through a lumbar puncture, looking uh, fundoscopically at the back of the eye to look for papilledema on the optic nerve. Of course, the most feared complication of idiopathic intracranial hypertension is not just the disabling headaches, but rather vision loss. And patients actually have gone blind as a consequence of the papilledema from that raised pressure. Uh, and it's typically the first line treatment is oral medications uh, with oral diuretics, uh, typically Diamox, to try to reduce spinal fluid production. And that is often successful in many patients, but many patients can't tolerate that medication long term. So in those cases, we may consider doing a ventricular peritoneal or lumbar peritoneal shunt to reduce the spinal fluid pressure. There is, however, some uh, portion of that population that will be identified to have uh, intracranial dural venous sinus stenosis that we may we think may be leading to the production of this uh, pressure gradient and that uh, as it turns out may respond to intravascular stenting of the dural venous sinuses to reduce venous outflow compression which uh, results in a reduction in spinal fluid pressures and it actually works uh, if you can d demonstrate that there's a pressure gradient across that dural venous sinus. Um, so the findings that we see radiographically that help to distinguish from Chiari or from uh, basilar invagination with low-lying uh, tonsils is uh, as follows. As you can see in this one, I'm missing an arrow, but the um, uh, cella or the pituitary gland ought to be, appears empty in this patient. You don't really appreciate the pituitary gland because it is completely flattened out against the floor of the cella. So we call that the empty cella syndrome. Uh, we also notice kinking of the optic nerves and optic nerve sheaths uh, because they are under pressure. Or occasionally we'll appreciate flattening of the back of the globe. So that uh, when the, the globe is not perfectly round across the back, it looks uh, a little bit flattened. That's an indication of raised intracranial pressure as well. So these are some of the findings we see. And uh, with regards to the dural venous sinuses, you see a normal dural venous sinus on the right. Here on the left, you can appreciate that on each side at the transverse to sigmoid junction, there is significant stenosis. And it, uh, we typically see that it happens on both sides in patients who are symptomatic from venous outflow compression uh, because of the uh, confluence of veins at the torcula. Uh, stenosis on one side typically wouldn't do it because you have outflow uh, available on the other side in, in that case. So bilateral transverse sinus stenosis may often produce this syndrome. So for our patients who have uh, signs or symptoms of elevated pressure, uh, which include the tuss of headaches, the headaches that are responsive to position or to valsalva maneuver, we would typically consider an LP to measure the spinal fluid pressures to see if, in fact, they're high. Uh, for patients, uh, you know, sometimes practitioners will be very nervous about doing that if there's cerebellar tonsillar herniation, uh, in which case you can also do intravascular venous pressure measurements or uh, actually do intracranial pressure measurements, which we have done on occasion to confirm a diagnosis. Um, finally, intracranial hypotension. This is an interesting disorder that, again, is exactly the opposite of intracranial 
idiopathic intracranial hypertension, uh, yet produces very, very similar radiographic findings and very similar symptoms. Uh, so this is defined as headache, the spinal fluid pressures of less than 60 millimeters of water or six centimeters of water. And sometimes pressures can actually be negative when measured on the lumbar, uh, lumbar puncture. Um, most of these cases are iatrogenic after an epidural steroid or uh, epidural anesthesia or surgery or something of that nature that results in the spinal fluid leak, but they can happen spontaneously. And this is something we have to be aware of in our uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome population. Because of the laxity in the dura, <clears throat> patients with EDS or hypermobility disorders are more prone to spontaneous dural diverticuli across the spinal nerve root sacs and with spontaneous spinal fluid leak. So they can result in spontaneous uh, spinal fluid leak with intracranial hypotension and headache. It is usually distinguishable from high pressure headaches of Chiari or IIH because of positional changes. These patients feel better when they lie down flat and they actually feel worse when they're upright. Typically the opposite for IIH, but not everyone does that. And occasionally it's weird. Some patients who have low pressures will still describe a worsening of their headache with a valsalva maneuver, which seems counterintuitive, but that is what is occasionally reported. They can also sometimes report that they can abate uh, or, or, or mimic their symptoms by jugular compression. So again, this is uh, uh, it makes it very, very difficult to, so, to differentiate between these disorders at times. So on imaging, one of the classic differences here is, first of all, you're not going to have some of the signs of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You're not going to have the, the empty cella, for example. Uh, but instead, what we see is it with contrast-enhanced MRI, there is smooth thickening and enhancement of the Dura, not the pachy meninges, but typically around the outside, the tentorium and the uh, convexity. We occasionally see uh, subdural hygromas or vascular engorgement due to the low pressure. So you can see that kind of pattern of enhancement here with the dense enhancement all the way around the periphery of the, of the dura and along the tentorium and the cavernous sinuses. Now, going back to craniosurfical instability, the Disorder we see most often in our hypermobile patients and our EDS patients. Uh, you know, why do these patients come to neurologic attention? Well, because many of them, as many as one third of patients with hypermobility will complain of headache. That can be their presenting symptom. And that headache could be secondary to an anatomic Chiari malformation, cervicogenic headache, uh, and a number of different other types of headache that uh, are seen quite commonly in uh, hypermobile patients. In fact, the, a, a well-known Chiari practice, a Chiari Institute in the East, looked at over 2,800 patients that they had managed for anatomic diagnosis of Chiari malformation over a five-year period, actually a six-year period, and found that 13% of them also met criteria for a hereditary uh, disorder of connective tissue, or EDS. So that's a pretty significant crossover between these patients. And as a result, there have been a number of fairly complicated uh, methods used to help identify the uh, bony anatomic relationship between the base of the skull and the top of the spine to identify those patients who may have what we would consider a secondary Chiari related to instability as opposed to a congenital Chiari malformation with normal anatomic alignment. And I won't bore you with all of the details of the angles and everything that are measured, but basically with the patient changing positions, uh, you can occasionally demonstrate a change in the position of the basion to the top of C1 or to the dens of the relationship between the um, uh, occipital cervical junction and the, uh, uh, and the bony alignment. And you can also look at, see a change in the angle of the posterior fossa with change in uh, neurological element uh, positioning between the sitting and the supine position. So for these patients, these are more of an acquired Chiari malformation that develops due to positional changes from instability of the cranial cervical junction. And this takes us all the way back to radiographic measurements that were done long before we even had CT scans uh, to look at some of these anatomic uh, um, alignments uh, that we see here uh, depicted in, in cartoon form to help us to identify what is the normal relationship between these bony elements and does this patient uh, fall outside that normal range, is that patient most like, more likely to be unstable? And what these practitioners identified was that if you have evidence of these 
uh, sort of acquired Chiari, that the decompression itself that we do for Chiari malformation isn't sufficient, that they might have to also undergo a stabilizing procedure or surgery. In fact, some of us would argue that maybe these patients shouldn't have surgery at all. Uh, in fact, in our practice, we, we try to look at uh, um, ways to avoid surgery uh, in order to kind of avoid some of this conundrum. When we identify that these patients, in fact, uh, who are truly unstable are coming to our practice, whether it's with a primary or a acquired hearing malformation or some other disorder, uh, there are a number of different treatment options that are considered. They range from bracing to physical therapy to surgical uh, fusion surgery or decompression surgery. And we'll kind of go over a few of these and to, to talk about some of the decision making. Quite frankly, bracing, I think, should only be used for acute symptom management. Uh, long-term bracing to, to treat somebody for neck pain from instability only uh, uh, creates a, a catch-22 because the wearing of the brace results in muscular atrophy. They lose muscular support. They become more unstable and more symptomatic, and it just aggravates the problem. So I do not recommend bracing as a long-term treatment option. Instead, what we prefer is very aggressive physical therapy, including asymmetric neck strengthening, we like to retrain the patient on their posture and their, uh, some of their daily activities. And for those patients who are having acute exacerbation of their pain, and other modalities such as dry needling actually turn out to work quite well. I don't fully understand the science behind it. Uh, many of our physical therapists do, and our PM&R doctors do, and they will uh, help exp uh, explain who's a good candidate. But uh, we've seen very, very good results in getting patients back to a more functional state where they can actually participate in their physical therapy more productively and manage their symptoms. And in this way, we hope to avoid needing any kind of surgery for that Ehlers-Danlos unstable patient. And part of the reason we're trying so hard to avoid surgery is the uh, phenomena known as adjacent segment disease. Uh, if the patient presents with instability at the cranial cervical junction and they undergo a decompression uh, because of an acquired Chiari followed by fusion of the occiput to C1 and C2, the concern we have is that now you have created a, a rigid lever arm against the C3 and C4 and C5, and what you can see is a domino effect, particularly in these hyperflexible patients where the ligamentous structure is not sufficient to withstand that new change in forces, and as a result, each se segment below the fusion starts to fail, and you end up extending the fusion all the way down to the thoracic spine. Now you have somebody who has true immobility because their, their entire neck has been fused, sometimes over stages of several operations, which is just not a very uh, feasible uh, practice over the long term. So again, for these reasons, at Mayfield, we typically try to avoid this type of occipital cervical fusion surgery uh, and, and at most costs, except for the patients who are grossly unstable or having neurologic compromise. So as a summary, we uh, caution all of our uh, providers who are seeing patients with Baylor Stanlis or hyperflexibility disorders to be, be aware of some of these other conditions that look a lot like it or that can arise as a consequence of their hypermobility. We uh, are worried about physical deconditioning because that increases laxity. We, uh, we uh, advocate for physical therapy and muscle strengthening and muscle training therapy for these patients and try to limit the use of bracing to avoid aggravating that deconditioning. Uh, we recognize that uh, uh, spinal instability can develop that can result in neurologic compression and neurologic symptoms. And we have to consider the risk versus the benefit of any kind of decompression or fusion surgery because of that concern we have over the domino effect down the, uh, down the chain of the spine. Uh, so uh, for your patients who have headache, neck pain, and maybe hypermobile, Consider a very comprehensive uh, dynamic workup of the uh, anatomy and uh, flexibility of the cranial cervical junction. We do have flexion ex extension spinal MRI available here at TriHealth. We've worked very hard with our neuroradiologists to do that. And they've put together some very good protocols that produce some really great images that are very, very useful for us. Uh, consider uh, medical treatment if there's concern about intracranial hypertension or hypotension or Chiari and when those those diagnostic conundrums come up and you're not sure if the patient really does have a symptomatic Chiari or hypotension or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, that might be the right time to engage a neurosurgeon to talk about what are the diagnostic maneuvers that can be undertaken to help make this diagnosis and what are the treatment options.
So we are always available. We are here to help. We are uh, here to uh, take care of our patients, including our, our EDS population. Uh, Mayfield is working very hard with the Neuroscience Institute at TriHealth to try to make sure that we have all treatment uh, options available to these patients. And we are uh, here and available to serve. And I thank you very much for your time.